not on uh, TV in a while, and so I was stiff. And I, and I looked at it, I'm like, why am I so stiff? Oh, because I don't – there's a trick to looking in the camera and moving your hand without losing focus, and I just forgot. And uh, right. anyway. And plus I wasn't I wearing find it, I find it really hard. Oh, not and not makeup, by the way, is – like – I might have to go yeah. buy makeup. Like I can't sit. I just like I'm not a vain you. guy, but it was it was a nightmare. It just looked terrible. No, it's, it is it is amazing what like what a, what, a, what a difference it makes. I mean, just to have like the shine taken off your forehead or whatever. I mean, yeah, and I have like natural bags under my eyes. I've had it since I was a kid, so I look like like yeah, The Walking Dead basically on camera. It's just a disaster. Right. Oh my so, God. are you where are you shooting from? Studio right near my house. For now, anyway, like I said, they're going to do studio stuff, and then eventually, like, if, if things go well, they want to fly me out and do stuff on in person, which is, I'm much better in person, and it goes better, so, we'll right. see. But thank you for asking. I mean, you and the whole crew have been doing great on uh, on Confidential. Well, unfortunately, it disappears during the season, which is, which is kind of sucky. Yeah, right. BK texted me today. He said he got into an argument with Hawk Harrelson about Sabermetrics. It was amazing. Oh, good lord. What? I did a spot on it. This is not live, is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is now. It just is. Okay. I did a, I did a spot on his radio show on, on his new radio show on Monday, and I got cut off mid sentence. It's like, gotta go, Jay. Bye. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was harsh. Wow. I thought you were friends. Yes. Yeah, what? seriously. Mm -hmm. Do you okay. introduce the segment, or how does this go? If you're live, what's the story? We just we just started to talk. About makeup. We have about makeup. makeup. We were no, talking right? about makeup, that's true. What? I was saying we were talking about makeup. That is actually what we were talking about. We're talking about, if, you know, people want to know about the behind the scenes stuff. What kind yeah. of makeup do you have to wear, Jonah? Let's, let's talk about baseball. I don't want to talk about me. <laughs> no. No? Oh, man. No. No. I'm not that interesting. Baseball's but, interesting. Baseball, we. We like baseball here. That's good. Um, Feels like it's been a slow week with all the weather stuff going on and, and like lack of action. I mean, I like you know being out of being out of this now for three days in a row on jury duty. I haven't really. I feel like I haven't missed all that much in terms of news. Like you know, usually if I miss a couple of days for you know a day or two for whether I'm sick or something like that, yeah. I feel like oh my god, there's so much going on. You know, I want to write about. It. Now it's like no, don't. Not missing it. Not missing yeah. it. It's like all this is doing is preventing me from write from not writing, you know, three or four things about small sample sizes that I that I, you know, will look back in, in weeks and wish that I hadn't written anyway. I'm and writing can... about um, after we're done with this. I'm writing about lincecum, and uh, it is small sample size. And I think that the only the best thing you could do is maybe there's some endemic cause. Yeah, I think it's easier with pitchers than hitters. If a hitter's Two for fourteen. That doesn't mean anything. But if Lincecum's throwing his fastball three miles an hour slower or something, it's like all right. And so you go back and look at like, what is Doug Thorburn written about well, this? And it's also it? it's also a continuation of it's a continuation of last year's last problems year, yeah. in some way. So you're you're well within your rights to, to to treat that as as a big story. Same with like weird uh, Roy Halladay again. Yeah. You know that's a big story. Not it's not that he's gotten bombed in one or two outings. It's not R.A. Dickey. Oh my God, is he going to fail in the American League East? You know, it's too early to, like, get on that bandwagon. But, you know, Roy Halladay not being able to pick up his velocity after a crappy year last year is all of a sudden, you know, that's a real story. God bless my Jays fans, friends, who are freaking the hell out right now. They're like, oh, we're supposed to be good. What's going on? Oh, uh, there. Hey, John. Hey, John. I found myself writing about it. Uh, Michael Young quite a bit, which is a place I, I never thought I'd, I'd find myself. Hmm. Can anyone hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. So my PC broke, um, so I'm using the laptop now. Okay. Broke. Broke. Come on, turn on. Wow. That's that. Yep. Too too much Orioles. Yeah, well, that's like any Orioles, and this 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 piece of crap is working just fine. So I don't it's know. a very fetching air conditioner behind you. Yeah, I know. I think it's it's vintage, by which I mean I believe it was made in 1982. Um, it was one of the many things my parents gave me as a quote unquote gift 
when I moved out. And my gift, I mean, they didn't have any space in their basements anymore. So uh, it's now I'm holding them. But yeah, so Jim Johnson um, finished giving us heart attacks earlier tonight. So that's that plus the computer breaking was why I was a little bit late. Got it. Got it. Is Chris Davis going to go completely crazy, John? Like, is this the year that bananas? He read his Twitter. Um, no, he's he's um. I don't know what the deal with him is. I've always said that his swing and how he approaches the game reminds me of me playing a, a baseball video game in that I'm completely fooled by anything that comes in around the knees that might look like it's going to be on the plate, and I swing at it. And when I connect, it goes flying, uh, even if I don't get all of it. Um, and I have to turn up the difficulty level. Because it's quite easy. And that's what it looks like he's doing right now. It looks like he's playing like I won't be the show on, uh, on Veteran, and he's been doing it for a while. So he still can't really tell what pitches are going to end up where. But we'll make contact with him, and as whereas, uh, like the, his grand slam, the grand slam that he hit against um, the why am I blanking on this? Which team it was? Rays, no. Rays, no, not the Rays. Home opening series. Twins against the Twins uh, in the first game they played that uh, that got him most of the national attention. It was a slider that was a couple inches outside. Most left-handed pitchers can make contact with the slider that's almost inside the right-handed uh, hitter's batter's box. If, if they hit it solid, they're going to like fly it out to the left field if they're a little bit late on it. He put it five rows deep in the left field stands because that's the kind of power Chris Davis has. Hmm. He still can't really control it that well. Um, he probably has as much pure power as, say, your top tier power guys in the league, your you know your Prince Fielders, that 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 set of hitters, but unlike those guys, it doesn't translate into the game as much as it does for those hitters. Um, if he can put it together this season, and he then he'll, I mean, because he used to be a huge prospect for the Texas, right, Warriors, right, like years ago. Yeah. Um, they thought he was going to be their first baseman, or I believe originally they thought he was going to be the third baseman, and then their first baseman for a long time. And then he got traded for a Koji White Hart. <laughs> um, well, I have to do those um, rankings every week, and so I only rank a few. I used to be around 30, and now I only do a few per week. And I kind of do them on the floor. And, I mean, this isn't new. It was the case last, last year, but it's, I'm looking at this roster, and I'm like, and Monica related. It's like, they're all Rangers. They're all. There's Strope and, and O'Day, and all these guys are really good. They were only the 27th best player of the Rangers. Like, that's incredible. Yeah, they, um, Buck Showalter, when he got, took over most of the control of the, he, basically there was this period between when Andy McPhail was leaving and before they hired Buquette, where McPhail was the GM, but, well, the executive vice president of baseball operations, but it was essentially Showalter uh, running the acquisition show. And that's when they got Darren O'Day off waivers. That's when they got Andy Chavez. Um, late in that season was when they dealt uh, Mike Gonzalez for Zach Phillips and yeah for Zach Phillips and dealt Lehara for um, for Tommy Hunter and uh, Chris Davis. Uh, so Showalter was as soon as the team started looking like it was uh, Chris Davis around him got um, got basically got the authority to bring in all of his old fa Taylor Teagarden. All his old favorites from the Rangers that the Rangers were willing to get rid of. Um, and that's worked out much better, better than it should have. Um, Tommy Hunter hasn't because Tommy Hunter's out pitch is a hanging curveball. <laughs> it does go out. It does. It go, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I think he's in on it, too, because his Twitter handle is Tommy Goes Boom. Oh, my God. And... Why? Like, what do you? I, I, he explained this at Fan Fest, I think, two years ago, where he like he made like some justification where the boom was him striking somebody out or something, and no, that's actually not what anybody thinks about when you when you're a pitcher, and someone says that a pitcher goes boom, no one's thinking that's a good thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, not a good sound. No, like there, there's no like. 
there's no good things associated with explosions in pitchers. Either either their arms are going, or the ball is leaving the ballpark, or something bad is happening. There's there's no you know there's no great imagery there. But, but yeah, Tommy goes boom. That's you can find him on Twitter. Uh, wow. So he is in the bullpen as the long man. Um, I believe that he is probably not too long for the Orioles roster. Uh, because he's limit, he's nearing the end of. of uh, he might have actually ex- uh, exhausted all of his options at, the, at this point. And if you can't be optioned, as Luis Ayala showed earlier this week, you're kind of useless to me. I think that's where they'll Yeah. Now everybody. Uh, okay, okay, he uh, Ayala was really great last year. He probably shouldn't have been as good as he was, mm-hmm. and he can't be sent down. And he's on the last year of his deal. And the Orioles are currently trying to keep T.J. McFarland, who was their Rule 5 pick, because I think Daniel Duquette really loves the Rule 5. So he plays into his he has He has a specific kind of player he likes, and that player is really kind of fringy in terms of talent, but it's cheap, and he can be messed around with. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that he's traded Ayala, he's able to, you know, play the... Uh, the Norfolk carousel and send guys down and bring guys up. So they'll always have a bullpen full of guys who are ready to throw, but also be able to keep TJ McFarland on the roster. He did this last year with Ryan Flaherty. He probably should demote Ryan Flaherty to Triple A uh, because he no longer has to keep him on the Major League roster, and Flaherty is not ready. I saw the, uh, the Norfolk carousel open for Arcade Fire. They were amazing. Just like a really fresh sound. <laughs> <laughs> John Parrish was the front man. Um, I believe, yeah, I, I, I want to, how many times did they send Parrish up and down? I want to say it was 2009 2010. I want to say uh, John Parrish was a pitcher. He was the fringy long man. I want to say they demoted and brought him up seven times, seven, eight times over the course of the season. Like, he would go down for a couple days and then come back. And it was just a running joke in the clubhouse. Um, so far... Yeah, I don't think they've made any, any other roster moves since the Ayala trade. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, but I, I think they're probably going to make a couple you know, promotions and demotions as uh, as the week goes on. I have a question for Jay. Yeah? We were talking about it off there, but you were saying, I mean, you're not full home plug from baseball in the last few days, but much more than you usually are. And I have no ability to do that. Between all the things that are going on, I just, every day, I'm immersed, immersed, immersed. What's it like to just have a different life for a few days and just not be driving? It's, it's really weird. I'm, you know, I like, I find myself, I mean, I'm watching games, and I'm trying to consume a lot of games, but I'm not really forming coherent thoughts about them. You know, like, I don't have, because I don't have to package it into, oh, here's this column I'm going to do for tomorrow. Or, you know, here's an, a move I have to analyze. Like when Jared Weaver got hurt, and I was like, well, I'm not going to be on the job, you know, I'm not going to be on the job for this one. You know, somebody else somebody else could, you know, gets to, gets to deal with that. I don't have to think about, you know, who's the sixth guy in the, in the Angels rotation, who's the seventh guy, uh, and, and stuff like that. It, it's very strange because you get so absorbed in this stuff on a day-to-day basis, and, and to even take a brief break from it, you know, for reasons you don't necessarily want to, it's it's strange. I did a, I did a roundup last night, of just all the weird stuff that happened in the majors yesterday, like the goat's head in Chicago, and you know various streaks coming to ends and weather stuff, and it was like try you know a crash course in a, in a day's baseball, but it felt like I hadn't watched in a week. Hmm. So I don't know. I miss. I do miss it though. I, I'm looking forward to getting back to this, but I could be on this case for another week. So one of the main reasons that I have not gotten American citizenship is because I'm convinced that they would put me on a jury every single day. Literally, that's an actual. I just I'm paranoid about being cornered for jury duty. Recently, within uh, DC, DC has a lot of crime for really not a lot of people who live there. And so they call you, whatever the max is, they just call you constantly. And so um, my wife was on a jury, and uh, I don't know what your jury is like, Jay, but uh, hers was not filled with rocket scientists. And so within two seconds, she was made the foreman, four-person, whatever. 
And, uh, yeah, it's just... This stuff just sounds oppressive. And you can't you can't screw around your phone. I mean, come on. Right. <laughs> what? There's nothing worth worth doing in life if you can't screw around your phone. That's like, you know, number one. Yeah, it, it just it sucks the air out of the room. Just, just you know, I mean, even in the downtime when you're waiting, I mean, you know, you at least then you've got your phone or whatever. Like when you're in the jury rooms, but I mean, there are people who just stare straight ahead. Don't no reading material, no nothing. Just like the guy, just like yeah, waiting for something to happen for an you know, hour. Next time when they do voir dire, just say that you're prejudiced against all races, and you'll be fine. I really should have done that. I, you know, I joke about it, but I really should have done that and gotten out of this. Had I had I known what I was going to be exposed to. Yeah. So. I think they usually do the uh, jury duty stuff from voter rolls, so don't vote. It'll be fine. Yeah. This was actually the first time I've been I've been even like called for jury duty in in more than ten years. I was like the last time I did it, I realized. I didn't even have a I didn't have a cell phone, let alone a smartphone, and I didn't I wasn't even a baseball writer at that point. I was a full time graphic designer. I don't even think I'd started futility infielder. So, you know, we're talking my my luck. I had I had a good run there. Uh, I think in in New York you're supposed to get called roughly about once every six years, and you know to go double that time, I think I did pretty well. That is good. Well, John mentioned the voting thing. I can't. That, that's, of course, the drawback of not having citizenship is I can't vote. So. Oh. But I don't like any of the parties anyway, so whatever. <laughs> yeah, your vote doesn't matter anyway. Well, that's another. There you go. That's another thing. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of political science research into the likelihood of just actually deciding an election with your vote. So you're not missing much. I might trade not voting for not having to do jury duty. Hmm. Uh, I vote for American Idol religiously, though. Oh. <laughs> That's not true. We have a question. Besides the echo, echo. John, put headphones in, something. You're making the sound echo. Am, am I still echoing? I turned down the volume. You're not echoing. You're making other people echo. Oh. Right. You're making <laughs> other people suck. That's <laughs> You're the only one not echoing. You're echo. clubhouse cancer, John. Oh. I don't know about that. I can make myself suck pretty easy. I don't know if that's John. Come on. Oh, well, all right. Let me see what I can do. Okay. So, okay. Flash a little bit of leg bag, too. Mm. Uh, well, so ask if, if there are any prospects that will get called up soon. Say again? Any prospects that will get called up soon is the question. Well, Will Meyer should get called up, or the Rays are going to score 14 runs all season. But that's another story. Um, I think it would. T you could see an injury. I mean, it's kind of whoever gets hurt first. Like if I don't know, Alan Craig goes down. Well, Alan Craig's not a good example. If Beltron went down. You would think that they would call up Tavares, but then again, they have like Matt Adams. They have all these other options, so they might not even do that. Obviously, if Kinsler or Andrews gets hurt, that would be pro far. I mean, it's just. You get the feeling that it's going to be something like that. Like when Trout and Harper came up last year, there wasn't any particular impetus other than, oh, yeah, these guys are awesome. Maybe they should be on our team. So maybe that could happen. But certainly in Profar's case, those spots were spoken for. That's the case in Tavares' spot. Myers is the most logical guy because the Rays are just, you know, they don't have a full roster. They're just missing a guy. They're kind of making do right now. So there's that. I mean, there's a couple of pitchers out there, but like we, I guess we, Wheeler's got a blister problem now. I'm trying to think of well, else. Garrett Cole. They're not going to call him up this soon. Yeah, Cole's yeah. been really struggling from what right. I saw. Right. Is it uh, better? Yeah. yeah it's, it's, no more echo. Okay. Yeah. And plus well, those are awesome. So. Well, we're pretty close to to the time where um, where uh, teams won't have to play Super 2 service service time games anymore. That's like um, midnight. That's, now that's in June. That, will, that won't be until June. They're getting close to when it won't be the it'll the, be the the free agent like the full year of service. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like that's that's by like late, you know in the next couple of weeks or so where you get to that. It, point. No, it's actually like today's the eleventh. I think it's tomorrow. Someone oh, wrote it? Okay. Jackie Bradley. So it was either Tim Britton or Brian McPherson from Proja was writing about right. Bradley before they knew if they were going to call him up or not, and, and they said the date was either April eleventh or April twelfth. So today's the eleventh. So. Okay. Yeah. Here's yeah. some. Gausman should be up. Um, 
I want to say fairly shortly, but probably sooner rather than later, given the fact the Orioles' rotation is not going to hold uh, based on their their performance so far. Um, Bundy he's, will not. He's having a uh, Kevin Gaussman's having a good night tonight, from yeah. what I'm reading uh, off of Jason Park's Twitter feed. Now, got... Dylan Bundy, on the other hand, yeah. has elbow tight forearm tightness, which is. And he's on the he is on the seven day DL for Bowie right now. He might have come off that. Uh, forearm tightness is like that's Act One of the five acts Tommy John surgery um, play. Hopefully, this instance of forearm tightness isn't that severe. It's just forearm tightness, but it's almost always never just forearm tightness. That's a really that's it's a really early indicator, but it's not. It, I mean. If you if you started cutting open every guy who had forearm tightness, you'd have like five times the number of Tommy John surgeries. It's it's not automatic that no. that it gets there. You're, you're you're doing this so it doesn't you know you're shutting him down so it doesn't go like straight to Tommy John surgery. But yeah, it's it's obviously something to worry about. But it's not like you know don't start jumping out the window yet. You'll have reason to further down the road. Yeah. Well, He's the PPA just said certainly that'll have to happen. So. Yeah. And but the, he's, the point is he's basically gone into giant baby mode from the Orioles. He's probably not going to pitch too many more innings um, until they're completely sure there's no more problems with his forearm, um, and that's going to rob him of a little bit of development time. His velocity was a little bit down in spring training, which probably isn't an issue, but could be related to the forearm tightness. Um, but Gaussman always was a little bit more advanced just because of where he came from and what he was doing. And people were saying even before this this elbow, uh, this forearm tightness injury for Bundy, that Gausman was probably a, a better had a better chance of, of making it to the majors in a you know an, an important role uh, earlier than Bundy did this season. It seems to me that if anything, it might not the, the pertinent question might not necessarily be which prospects are going to be called up. It might be which ones are going to be sent back down. Uh, R.J. Anderson did a great piece at, at Prospectus about Aaron Hicks. It's early, but I mean, it's not just that his stats aren't there. He just kind of looks a little lost at the plate. And I don't know anybody who'd be dumb enough to pick him for rookie of the year, me. But <laughs> probably, probably not going to happen if he keeps up at this rate. And I just picked him mostly because of opportunity. I was like, oh, he's going to get 600 at bats. Right. But I mean, if he's not producing, not that the Twins have anything at stake this year, but if they feel that you know he's not developing and they got to send him down, then that might happen. Bradley's another guy. You know, Ortiz is going to come back. Maybe Bradley goes down. That that'll be interesting to see as well. So uh, I think it could sort of be in reverse, where the the next moves to come will probably be some of these guys going back rather than coming up. Bradley being up always kind of mystified because I what I thought was going to happen was they'd make a midseason deal with Ellsbury once they were you know once it yeah. looked like they'd be out of contention, and then Bradley come up and he'd be the everyday center fielder around midseason. And that's. Him That's in left the, field just wastes his biggest tool, which is his range and his defensive ability. Him in left field is a waste. Well, this is the Carl Crawford argument too, right? Yeah. Which went over so well in Boston last time. Yeah, that's something that always puzzled me too, even as the Internet's foremost Jackie Bradley advocate. Um, I'm just mystified that, that the Red Sox would bring him up, particularly with service time issues, his being represented by Scott Boris, as somebody – who only hit like 270 in, in 200 and change bats above high A. I mean, I no matter how well he hit in spring training, I, right. I still don't believe he's ready. The whole left field defense thing is interesting to me. Someone interviewed Bill James about it. He's like, that's not true. A good defense in left field is super important at Fenway. And he didn't really elaborate, maybe because it's secret sauce stuff, but I, I was like, oh, okay. Maybe we're missing something. Because I, I just think of well, and the, why do you sign Johnny Gomes to, for, to a two-year deal to play out there? Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. Well, and they've had some stiff. I mean, Jim Rice was not a – he had no range. I mean, they, they had, they've had some stiffs over they the years. They had Manny out there. I mean, they had they guys who could motherfucking hit their way out of the – you know, past their defensive problems. I mean, Jackie Bradley, God love him, he's not he's not that guy, at least not yet. Right. Um, you know, getting back to Will Myers, though, you know, I what, what I find interesting is, you know, for all the – the assumption that you know that the Rays need to game the service clock. They've also been very proactive with the you know with the um, the pre-arbitration contracts yeah. and tying guys up through the through the first few years. And it seems like you know if Myers really is the kind of cornerstone player that he's expected to be, 
you're not gonna it's not gonna matter his service time because you're gonna have him on one of those deals. Maybe not a lot, you know, the equivalent of a Longoria deal, but you're gonna probably gonna try to aim for something like that. Um, you know, where it's not gonna matter when he, you know exactly when he reaches arbitration. Here's the problem, Jay. It takes two to tango, and I'm not convinced that Myers' camp would be into it. I have no doubt that the Rays have at least opened discussions about it. Mm-hmm. And some guys who are 22 or 23 years old, and they could break their leg tomorrow and make no money in the big leagues, would say, oh, okay, that's fine. That's what Longoria did. And, you know, oh, Shields, Crawford, oh, wow. before those guys left, they actually got signed, and many, many of them. And uh, maybe Myers is looking at it, maybe particularly looking at Longoria and saying, Longoria left, I don't know, $70 million on the table or something like that. I don't want that. I want $70 million. $70 million is awesome. So screw you. I'm not going to do it. And that's within his rights. You know, it's, there's, there's a risk-reward equation. Sure. And if the Rays are coming in and they're offering something similar to Longoria, I think six, seven, eight million, eight years, and we'll give you $45 million or something, you might say, I'm good. I'm going to play it out. And... Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have specific knowledge that the Rays have offered him a deal, but they went to Longoria when he was in – he signed that deal when he was hit six days into his major league career, but they basically negotiated when he was in AAA. They said, let's talk. And I'm sure that they've had the same uh, discussions with Myers and his agent. So you're totally right in theory, and I might be wrong about maybe they haven't approached Myers, but I have a feeling that, uh, you know, maybe the number is just not there or Myers just flat out does not want to commit this early. Right. If he's that good, right? I mean, if he's going to be a 35 home run, you know, cornerstone type of player, and he's not a pitcher, don't forget, so there's less risk, theoretically, then, uh, yeah, you know, you might just not want to give up that much money. So Also, if it's the case, if you're right, if he, if it is in play to get a contract, I totally agree with you, they should have called him up yesterday, no question about it. It's also good to remember the Royals are another team that likes to do that pre-R buyout thing they did with Sal Perez. Um, they tried to do it with a couple other players, and they just traded the guy. Um, so it's possible they approached him about something like that, and he wasn't able, he wasn't willing to talk to him about that too, and that sort of tipped them over the edge on the whole. Room. That's a fair point, actually. I'd never considered that in the context of of all of the you know beating up on the Royals, most of it justified over over the decision to trade him. But yeah, you know, it's, it's a reasonable point because they, you're right, they did do it with with Perez. And who else, I'm trying to think, who else did they do? has an, a long term deal too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I, it, you might be right, John, but that's early. Like, the, the whole thing about the Rays going to Longoria and AAA, and they did it with B.J. Upton, too, by the way, and it didn't work. But uh, I've never heard, and I don't, I don't, I'm not plugged into all 30 organizations, and I can tell you chapter and verse when they've approached who, but I've never heard of anybody going to a minor league player and saying, here's a nine-year deal to take it. I, I think that the Royals might have had some thoughts about what if Myers develops will go to him in year one or year two or whatever, but I, I'm not so sure they would have brought it up with him before he even made the majors, as good as he is. Well, Maybe, Perez, I don't know, but it would Perez surprise me. got his deal like what, like 20, 30 plate appearances, and he, he got it he got it real early. Like well, yeah, the, early He had with that, that, for that 50 game season under his belt before last year, and he got yeah. the contract before last year, then, um, and then he got hurt. Mm. Right. Yeah, I don't know that anybody's even considered doing a Longoria deal or a deal like that before or since. Which is silly, by the way. I don't. I mean, the dollars are just not that risky to do it. I mean, even if you're a low revenue team, well, especially if you're a low revenue team, it just makes too much sense. Again, with pitchers, it's very iffy. Uh, but with a hitter, if you just if what's the hit rate on guys who are as good as Longoria or Myers? I mean. Do any of them turn into terrible players? At the very least, Myers would be, you know, he'd hit, I don't know, 20 homers and be a below-average right fielder. That has some value. So, I don't know. I, don't know, I can't help but wonder if maybe we're, with all the um, arbitration here, uh, buyouts and te- team signing star players to extensions, maybe there are going to be players, and I think you hit it on the head with Myers, um, there are going to be players who are will, willing to risk it because the free agent payday, there's more free agent money now than ever, and we're getting into a phase where there's going to be fewer players who are worth that money. So maybe somebody like Will Myers says, or Giancarlo Stanton seems like an obvious choice, to say maybe I'll, I'll swing for that you know, $25, $30 million a year once I hit free agency. Well, it's pretty obvious Stanton's not going to be signing a long-term deal with his current. No, at the very least. It's, but the thing—that's an interesting point too. 
the thing that it seems is going on is if you look at some of the figures of some of these deals, the, the re-ups before they made free agency, there's no hometown discount. Maybe it's a little lower than they would get in free agency, but Felix getting you know seven one seventy five and some of these other deals, Wainwright's going to be you know well into his thirties by the time he's done with his deal. I'm not so sure that they're really sacrificing anything by taking maybe a little bit, you know, because the free agent market is empty, so there could be some huge bidding war. Well, but I think these guys are looking at it as not only security, but saying, you know what, this is like pretty close to top of market, maybe 10, 15 yeah. percent less. I'm not giving up that much. Well, I think the the other th the other thing to remember is that our notion of the market, you know, changes. I mean, I, I think all these annual deals are higher than you know we would have expected even a few months ago. Um, because the you know because the money really is there and the t you know the TV revenue is coming and and these teams know it and they know, they know you know where their uh, you know what their budgets look like and they've decided that they're willing to pay you know X dollars for you know for the top of the line and yeah. and you know there, there, there's some headroom there above what we took to be the top of the market. Yeah, it seems to be more about cost certainty with some teams than necessarily cost efficiency. Um, and teams are willing to pay, it seems, especially uh, the, the as more details about the Elvis Andrews contract came out, the less sane, I guess, it seemed from Texas's point of view, especially once Andrews is able to, you know, just opt out twice in the last four years of the deal if he wants to. Essentially, I believe the last four deals are more or less player options. Um, but what they are doing is they're essentially signing him to slightly above market value for a shortstop now having any idea what the market for shortstops can look like three years from now once his arbitration buyout ends. Uh, ends. And that's just more or less saying the market could go insane on guys like Elvis Andrews, especially if he develops a little bit of power while remaining a great defensive shortstop with all his other tools. We don't know if he's going to be an $18, $19 million a year player um, when, he, when that buyout that we, of his arbitration year ends. Years ends. And we don't know what Scott Boris is going to do with him once he actually does hit the market. So we're paying him a little bit less than Jose Reyes is making per year on this deal. But we know what we're going to be paying him. We can just put it on the books now and more or less just worry about the rest of the team when we get there. And the only way that's a bad contract is if he becomes if he, if he's Sean Figgins and he just falls apart without being hurt. Uh, because if he gets hurt, then they can get insurance to cover him. Because I'm sure I'm like, I guess the Mets and the Santana contract. I'm hoping the Texas Rangers are actually insuring their contracts. Um, but the uh, the only way that becomes a like a real, real bad, bad contract, dire contract, is if Andrews just forgets how to play baseball at age 26, and that doesn't seem like something that ha has a huge, you know, risk of happening. I want to hear from our host about what she thinks about the Andrews deal. No. I'm a fan of the Andrews deal. I wanted them to do a contract extension for him. I am a big fan of his. I'm still very confused about what they're going to do with Profar. Um, but the, the only the only thing is the player opt out after four years, which is like like if he stays hot, then that'll be at his peak, and I can't imagine him not opting out at that point. You know, we haven't we haven't seen a significant opt out where somebody didn't opt out, have we? I mean, for the most part, it's A Rod, Sabathia. They all opted out and then yeah. re-signed with the team. Yeah, right. At a higher rate. Lots of money. So I mean, that would probably be what happened in this at this juncture too. Andres would opt out, and then the Rangers would pay out the nose to keep him. But right. if he doesn't opt out, the reason he's not opting out is because he's not actually good. Enough. He's not, you know, good enough at playing baseball to make more money. And at that point, he's not worth the salary he's being paid. So you sort of want him to opt out. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully resign him for market value at that point in the future. Uh, the opt-out years are there just specifically as, as a safety net for, An on, for Andrews to get him to sign the deal now. Uh, well, may yeah, I was going to say maybe this is we should just look at it as a four-year contract then. Maybe Andrews is never going to agree to give up that many years, or Boris wasn't. And so in our mind, we just have to say, okay, he's giving up two years of ARB and two years of free agency, and that's uh, that. He's giving up four years of free agency. Sorry? The, they, they'd already bought out his uh, arbitration years with an earlier deal with... Uh, right, it replaces that one. Okay, so even... No, yeah, no, it's right. an extension beyond. That contract stays in place. 
the new extension extends after his arc. Okay, so then if that's four years of free agency, yeah, so if that's four years of free agency, that's still a good deal instead of seven years yeah. of free agency. And I think if we just look at it that way, then it just it's less disappointing if we say, well, gee, they could have had seven, but maybe they never could have had seven. Maybe this was just the way it was going to be. Yeah, with Scott, I mean, Scott Boris doesn't do full buyouts of your free agent, right. you know, lifespan period. Like, it's just not something that's uh, part of what he does. It's you know, he loses clients over his not being able to bend his uh, his negotiating strategy to what clients want. Uh, like, the reason Matt Wieters hasn't been extended by the Orioles is a war's client, and the, the most force is going to let you do is buy out his arbitration years. Um, unless you're willing to do something like the Andrews deal, which is give him, all right, if he's bad, it's an eight-year deal, but if he's good, it's a four-year deal. Well, look, we've, as far as Boris goes, we've now got three clear exceptions. We've got, that, we've got Andrews. We've also got Jared Weaver, which was a very, you know, very yeah. below market contract. We've, and and Carlos, Carlos Gonzalez, which is a, you know, I mean, that's a, what was a seven-year deal in year three of his playing. You know, I, I, I'm a little hazy on the details. But those are all, you know, significant exceptions, which taken together show you that, I mean, he's, you know, he's flexible if that's what the client wants. And, and, and I mean, the you know, with Weaver, the funny thing is that Weaver was such a bitch to sign – in the first place, I mean, the you know, as far as when he was drafted, it was such a such a uh, uh, an ordeal to get him signed, um, and then he you know took like what five years, eighty five million was that what it was something yeah. like that? Yeah. You, you know, know what? what? Doesn't look too bad for Jared Weaver right now. What's that? Yeah, that actually, doesn't look too bad for Jared doesn't Weaver. Look too bad for Jared Weaver right now, given what we his fastball can year. get the loaf of bread. Yes, yes, that's a problem. The yeah. whole Angels pitching rotation is... Yeah, that went sideways real quick. Yeah. Um, I mean, since Jack Wilson... Winning the division. I just didn't, I didn't buy it. I, I think the Angels can still have a chance to make the playoffs, but I just don't think they're better than Texas. Texas' top four starters yeah. are great. And according to ESPN.com, whenever Nick Tepish pitches, it's Tepesh mode, which is amazing. So. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's, that's the sad. headline they used. So good, so good, so good. Yeah, I had I had uh, the Angels as the one team missing the playoffs out of you know from that division, uh, you know with the A's as the potential wild card, which I'm not sure I believe the A's could you know are really good enough to to merit a, a wild card pick, but I didn't think the a the Angels had the pitching for it, you know, and obviously now the depth is severely compromised. I mean, I thought the pitching rotation wasn't going to be that great, and I knew their bullpen wasn't that great. I'm really surprised at how bad everything else has kind of been for them so far. Well, so I, I was, like, oh, I was never a... Yet. Hamilton's not doing well. It's I was never a huge proud. Josh Hamilton believer, even at the beginning of this contract. Just his approach is not going to... <laughs> well, we're nine games into the contract. Let's, you know, let's... We're still at the very beginning of this contract. Well, and he's well, an I, He's an exceptional player. I mean, Hamilton's skill. Hamilton's like Vladimir Guerrero. He just swings at everything, and that's not a problem. It's going to be a problem later when his bat speed slows down. I don't know if we could say that his bat speed is already slowed. He had 43 homers last year. So, right. in general, I agree with you. I think it could end up being a bad contract. I just we don't have enough data to say right now. This, I mean, we know Hamilton gets lost for weeks at a time. I mean, we saw that yeah. last summer. Yeah. You know, particularly he's, when it's sunny out. You know, he's in the middle of that right now, and and. And he picked a bad time to do it because, you know, he started the new contract and he went to Texas and, you know, played national televised games and whatever. And so everybody's freaking out about it. But, you know, it's, I think it, it's, um, it's way too early to start, you know, extrapolating from that and saying, yeah, that it's all gone sour in year one. Um, cause he's but I think Mike, get... Mike's point about the long-term risk is definitely well taken. Well oh, absolutely. Taken. Absolutely. I, mean, I don't have any. Yeah, I don't think that's, well, that's used what... to anybody here. But that's sort of what happens when ownership gets involved in directly making deals and taking money right out of like separate accounts. Because <laughs> Hamilton's Hamilton's entire like paycheck is coming out of a separate Art Moreno account, from what was reported. Like they just forgot, you know, Jerry Depoto, don't worry about your budget. This is all coming from a separate separate pot. Um, See, if, and if I were Jerry Depoto, I'd say, can I spend that on anything <laughs> yeah. else? You know, you well, hired me to run your baseball team. Can I tell you how to prudently spend that money? And the answer is no. But I would have said, I would have said, <laughs> that instead, please, because we've got yeah. outfielders. We we need more starting pitchers. I don't think Greggy's going to be worth 147 million dollars either. 
But that's part of, mostly because he's a pitcher. I mean, does he have an opt out as well? Yeah, he does. He does. He does. And his is a little riskier because you know, I mean, look, if a pitcher could be in the midst of Tommy John surgery or something like that when that when that opt out comes due. Um, and with Granky, we've already gotten hints that uh, uh, you know, or, or you know, I guess elbow uh, the, issues, elbow issues, and not necessarily Tommy John level elbow issues, but. You know, it's the guy's never had an elbow problem before, and suddenly he he had one this spring. So, you know, that's a little nerve wracking if you're, if, you know, if you're if you if you own that opt out. Yeah. Plus, you guys, can he handle the bright lights and pressure of the big city? Oh my god. That's that's such a tired fucking narrative. <laughs> Welcome to baseball writing, my friend. It's funny yeah. that Shad Billingsley is actually the guy getting more of that treatment from Dodgers fans right now than Zach Greinke. This might be the only time that Zach. Rank- He's career. He hasn't been the butt of the is this guy psychologically able to play baseball um, narrative because Billingsley has been like the subject of like eighty five billion Dodgers fan. Yeah, you, chairs, you should I say Billingsley and butt more often in the same sentence. That guy is huge below the waist. Wait, no, oh, that sounds bad. Is this the scouting report or? Also, you're talking about the psychological ability of Billingsley to play, to play baseball. The left side of their infield physically cannot play baseball, so that's probably a oh, yeah, serious. We oh, need God. to talk about Bud Black and the Yonder Alonzo experience. That's fun. Last night. That was he insane. Was, that was great. Um, for those who are not familiar, Bud Black um, pinch hit for Alexi Amarista in the eighth inning of the Dodgers-Padres game last night. With Mark Kotze, the problem he was down three to one or four to one at the time. The problem was that he had no more middle infielders. So for some reason, he decided to move first baseman uh, Yonder Alonso over to second base, while keeping Jed Jerko, who they've been trying to convert from third to second base all spring training, at third, which was odd until a left-handed hitter came, a right-handed hitter came up. No, a lefty came up. And he switched them, put Jerko at second and Alonzo at third. And so and Bud Black would move the two of them back and forth between second and third base based on the handedness of the batter. Not based on whether or not, whether or not they pulled the ball, not based on anything else, but whether or not the batter was right or left-handed. Um, there, the Orioles actually did something like this in spring training, but that's uh, between Nate, uh, Nate McLeod and uh, Trevon Robinson, I believe, with left and center field, but that's important realized that they were in spring training, not in the game that mattered. Um, unfortunately, Bud Black guessed right and had Yonder Alonso at third base when a, um, or at second base when a ball came to third and Jerko had to turn a double play, I believe. Uh, but they did, they did give up a run because Alonso made a, a pass diving Jeter uh, dive on a ball that was like uh, three steps to his left or something while at second. Um, I was yeah, really he looked like he was swimming to that ball. Oh, it was great. Um, and Alonso was actually the last batter of the game. They had the tying run at second base, and uh, Alonso was up to bat, and he did not look like he wanted the game to go on that much longer. <laughs> uh, well, you know, what was weird was, like, I remember during spring training, um, they were all – Black was also trying to come up with configurations to fit Logan Forsythe into the infield. Once Chase Headley went down, and he had all these like, well, there'll be situations where we've got Forsyth at second and Jerko at third. There'll be situations where we've got Jerko at second and four, and like, and he was basically crawling up his own ass, like you know, sounding like Casey Stengel on acid, basically, <laughs> you know, which, which is like all these permutations that also involved Emma Rista. And I mean, it was, it was one of the greatest quotes I've ever seen him at. Like, just like he basically ran through every single permutation over the course of this interview, and I can just imagine like all the Padres beat guys just like trying to like. Wait, did you say that? It was like, I'm just trying to parse it. Because it, it was, sounds like he just said, well, Logan Forsythe's on the DL. Fuck it. We'll do this with Yonder Alonso. Yeah. Um, which is probably not the best way to use Yonder Alonso. The first thing that came to mind when I saw this is Joe Madden is so jealous right now. <laughs> Joe Madden would not have lost all his middle infielders in the eighth inning. Probably this, not. This well, if he like, did, I think he'd almost do it on purpose, though, just to show that he could pull this off. I think The only... Bud Black joined like rarefied air by doing that. The only people I've ever seen lose all of 
um, a position of importance, middle infield or catcher, but due to pinch hitting or pinch running madness in like the eighth inning of a game and have it you know come back to haunt them, are like Clint Hurdle, Jim Tracy, Victor Mesa for Team Cuba in the World Baseball Classic, and Victor Mesa had like the worst. Victor Mesa's World Baseball Classic was a clinic on how not to manage a baseball team. <laughs> I have I there uh, you the way that you know there's a directive out for umpires to be super lenient and never run a manager is that game where Victor Mesa threw the ball at the umpire's feet three times and didn't get run. Hell, hell, it's the game where Victor Mesa went out to the mound and rubbed the ball up wearing batting gloves continuously for like six or uh, six across six or seven innings and didn't get run. Um, the patience of that home plate umpire is is not the patience you see on display in a major league baseball game. Mesa would have been ejected five times over um, in that, and he was doing things like he was exhausting his bench before the end of a nine inning game, screaming like a little league parent from the dugout, um, just all sorts of immature stuff like that. And uh, Buck Martinez and the twelve year old they had doing play by play. Um, over there in that division were just talk, going on and on about what a great manager he was because that it was wasn't, the press kit. It, it was partially he was a great manager, but but they did talk about how scary and intimidating he was a lot. Yeah, yeah. and it was it was like... It That's, was, and it you seem to have watched a lot more of Team Cuba than I did, but my recollection was, wow, that Victor Mesa, he's, his players are terrified. Yeah. Oh. Well, either yeah, him. No, or I, I saw the. I saw some of the stuff that John did. It, Victor Mesa looked like a guy who you know might stab you just just to pass the time. Mm-hmm. He he <laughs> looks like it was like very was much like watching a team very, being managed by a sports radio caller. <laughs> what does it say? Or the delegate of a communist dictator? Yeah. Well, I mean, the team the team president is Fidel Castro's kid, right? Yeah. Um. The uh, and I'm pretty sure you could if you read between the the lines of enough of Martinez and his play-by-play guys shtick, it became obvious that their entire access to Mesa was like two or three interviews with um, Raúl Castro, whatever his name is. Um, it didn't sound like they actually had access that much access to Team Cuba. Whatsoever. Well, I don't think it, yeah, I don't think anybody had access to yeah. Team Cuba in the World Baseball yeah. Classic. I mean, it was like people didn't have access to to even. You know the 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 English speaking teams. I mean, it was all very controlled in a way that like Major League Baseball is not. Um, you know, you basically you're not allowed. You weren't allowed into locker rooms. I mean, it's, you know, you're interviewing the guys during you know batting practice or or you know post game you know press conferences. It's not like you could just you know go from locker to locker in the in the Team Cuba room and, and get them to speak <laughs> candidly. Um, that that kind of stuff just doesn't exist. Uh, in, the, in in that process, but uh, you weren't even going to get that from, say, you know, Team Canada or, you know, Italy. I mean, obviously those guys are certainly much more willing to talk, but there was very still a very controlled environment, from what I understand. And there's there's also no danger of an Italian pitcher being asked a question like, "Why'd you go with the with the changeup two two there?" And also, "Would you like political asylum?" So. Yeah. No, but the Italian, you know, if it, if it was a real Italian, I mean, you talk about, you know, like, he could, he could collapse the government. <laughs> or, you know, or talk, talk about a pension for fascism. I mean, I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff there. Um, My Piazza seemed to be the, the main, uh, I believe the most media information we got about Team Italy was that Mike Piazza loved to reinforce slash talk like a ridiculous stereotypical Italian. Um, and there was like there were three or four instances where the uh, Italy's uh, pool announcer talking about how uh, Piazza would like repeatedly correct their pronunciations and start doing like the huge hand gestures and like the stereotypical uh, da, 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 type stuff, which I just don't know what how much how how helpful you're being for Team Italy in baseball <laughs> if. If you're doing like if you're doing one step away from silly Super Mario caricatures, oh, it sounds um, sounds a lot like most Italian guys from Eastern PA that I know. <laughs> what else do we have to talk about? Um, I've only got a couple more. Asking about the Solaire incident. 
Oh, oh the yeah. Solaire incident. Oh, wow. I'm still kind of shocked, one, that he only got five games, and two, that yeah. the Cubs sort of came out, like, actually... Like, I don't think they, they you know, just went as far as justifying him going going into the dugout, getting a bat, leaving the dugout, going to the opposing dugout, and starting swinging it around in front of people. I don't think they justified it, but the party line being that, like, offering the excuse that they said something bad about his family and that, like, that that doesn't even, like, begin to explain that. Like, if, if Soler is just now hearing opposing players talk shit about his family... What has he been? Uh, he doesn't sound like a baseball player. What has he been doing the rest of his life? It's not like you know this is something like new. Um, there, uh, on you, you, people talk shit a lot of shit on a baseball diamond on any sports you know diamond, especially people um, in developmental leagues like that who may not be the most mature and may not be you know at the major level and that level of professionalism. Not mature you, enough to yeah. you know not menace people with a bat. You, yeah, you don't run into the dugout, grab a bat, run to the other dugout, and start swinging it around. And it's not like a funny, like, uh, Izzy Alcantara moment either. It, he didn't, like, all right, Izzy Alcantara's biggest crime was, and he shouldn't have done this, and it was silly and hilarious and really dangerous, was kicking a catcher in his catcher face mask before charging the mound. That displays some zoo levels of planning and tactics for a baseball mound charge. It's really dangerous, and that still doesn't really approach grabbing a bat and going into the opposing dugout and swinging it around. That what Soler did sort of jumps the line from an actual from a baseball brawl and goes over to like attempted aggravated assault. Um, and I don't see any justification. And there, I I can't think of anything that could have been said to Soler in that confrontation at second base where the most justifiable, like, the, the exact, the entire ceiling of what could be justified in his response wasn't just beating the shit out of the second baseman. Like, what could the second baseman have possibly said that makes it even conceivable that the response is to go at the dugout? Like, was it me and the rest yeah, of my team and my managers think this about your family? I, I somehow doubt that came into play. <laughs> We think you're going to be on the Cubs, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, okay, well, John, what, like, what do you think a more appropriate penalty would have been? I mean, 15 games, I was games, thinking, no, yeah, yeah, I, I thought 25. 25? You take, a, you take a baseball bat and you go into a dugout and start swinging at people? I mean, let's think sit. about minor league punishment for weed. Yeah. That's 50 games. Yeah. Yeah, you get twenty. Yeah, that's part. Of, that's part of the. That's part of the drug program, which and it's um, stupid. It's stupid, yeah. and it's it's unfair because a guy who gets on the forty man roster doesn't get tested. Um, but uh, that's you know, so that's grossly disproportionate in in that regard. Uh, also America, but, by the way. That's what's that? This is also America more than baseball. Yeah. Except uh, my state. My state's awesome. <laughs> What about uh, Del Delman Young? Was it was Delman Young suspended for when he threw the Delman bat? Delman Young throws the bat, hits the umpire, sits 50. for 50 games. That, that, seems, that seems like the, I mean, one struggles to come up with an analogous incident to what Solaire did, but that's yeah. right. as close as Well, I, I mean, think. if Solaire hits anybody, he doesn't just sit for the rest of the year. He goes to jail. Proceedings. Yeah, criminal yeah. proceedings. Start. Um. He didn't hit anybody, as far as we know. If we, he did, we would have heard about it by now. I'm absolutely certain. Um, but as it is, I think they said I, I would say 25 games, and then banish him to the, comp the complex games until, like, at least, you know, the the end of that minor league season. Get him out of that area. Send him to the complex. Have him work with coaches. Hopefully, let him learn that there is, you know, you don't go charging into other people's dugouts. Because if this had happened in Major League Baseball, and we had video of this, they would still be playing it today. Constantly. On loop. The, you know, the Cubs player that charged into the Brewers' dugout or whatever with a baseball bat. I mean, you have to think his teammates would have held him back if it had been Major Leaguers. I mean, like, who understood, you know, what this kid was getting himself into. Um, I mean, it took Javier Baez and Mariano Duncan to restrain him. At this point, to two guys, one of whom is, I believe Bias is a pretty big power prospect, isn't he? 
I could be mistaking who Javier Baez is, but it took two guys to restrain the Solera monster. at the bat. Um, and that was after he already had made his way to the dugout, so it sounds like Soler was not in a mood to be stopped. Um, and, and that's just unacceptable. And there, in Major League Baseball, the sport is very lucky. There's there's no easy consumable video of this incident. Um, I think he should be sitting a lot longer than five games. I agree. And yeah. I bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Nothing you said. Thanks for having me, Lana. Thanks for coming. See you, Jonah. Thanks, Jonah. Yeah, see you guys. Yeah. I'm nearing the end of my pitch count here, too, so. You can wrap yeah. it up. Well, I had a really good Mariano Duncan joke, though. I can tell it late. Yeah, you just, that's what Twitter's for, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm about done as well. I have. Sleep, dude. Well, should we wrap right. it? Yeah, yeah, let's wrap it up. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. Say good night, Gracie. Da, 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 da.